We are a nonprofit founded in uh, 2018, uh, dedicated to using pack goats to provide outdoor or what we call mountain therapy to veterans and first responders. Yeah, they're, they're, they're smart animals. They're crafty. And, and to this day, we have no idea, no idea how they got out of those pits. It never crossed my mind that that could be like a huge thing uh, that was therapeutic for you, doing those same activities but not being forced to do them. Welcome back to another episode of Wildlife Outdoors, guys. We have a very exciting guest today. Uh, luckily, we were able to schedule it. We're, this is our first interview actually during the middle of the day, so we we're able to get this going. But uh, today, we're going to go ahead and welcome Casey Brewster. He is a conservation biologist, a postdoc research associate at the University of Arkansas, and a professor at Northwest Arkansas Community College. So welcome, Casey. How you doing, man? Man, I'm doing really good. I'm excited to, to chat with y'all. This is going uh, um, to be a good Good interview, I think. I think it's going to be fun. It's it's a little different because we're interviewing you on something that I'd never even heard of before. <laughs> and so we have a mutual friend, Stephen, and he was telling me that you go out on, uh, you know, hiking trips, hunting trips, fishing trips, but with pack goats. Like, I've never even heard of that. How did that even come about? Yeah, so it's a good question. So really, the as far as like why I chose pack goats and why I went down that route, I uh, I've always liked goats. I, my, um, I had a nickname of the goat uh, while I was in the military for a short time period. It came after uh, the Adam Sandler skits on the goat. Mm-hmm. Do, you, do you all remember that? Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah, th- those dirty skits. And um, yeah, so I always liked goats. And then um, and I was interested in doing some something kind of revolving around sort of what our main theme is, outdoor therapy and whatnot. But I had no clue that I would include goats. And then one of my close friends sent me some uh, YouTube videos, texts to me. He's like, you like goats? You're into goats. Dude, you know about pack goats? And I'm like, pack goats? I'm like, what? Um, my goats, you know, at that time were really tiny. And uh, so I look at these videos, these elk hunters out west with these giant goats. And I'm like, oh, my God, dude, that is me. That is I've got to do this. So, like, I don't know, within three days, I'd con my wife in to let me go <laughs> find a couple of, <laughs> of future big goats. They were babies at the time, but I mean, they were going to be huge goats and started packing with them or hiking with them. You can't pack with them until they're much older, but started hiking with them and fell in love with it. And then sort of um, without giving too many things away on how the project sort of went, um, ultimately led to the nonprofit itself. So yeah. that's awesome. And so speak on that nonprofit. I see you got a shirt on that says Snake yes. Mountain Pack Goats. Yes, that's us. So we are a nonprofit founded in uh, 2018, uh, dedicated to using pack goats to provide outdoor or what we call mountain therapy to Mm -hmm. veterans and first responders. It's always free for the veterans and first responders and sort of. um, uh, So the main mission is usually from a Friday morning to a Sunday afternoon. We uh, meet up, we hike into the backcountry areas in the Ozarks or the Washita's, a handful of different places that we go. We set up a base camp and then we'll do whatever activity. So fishing, hunting, hiking. Um, We do a lot of uh, workshops. Here recently we've started doing a lot of workshops. So a lot of different things. And then we pack out on Sunday. We do one of those a month uh, throughout the year. Every now and then we'll pull off two, but it's, it's, Tough, tough for me and, and our schedule to do that mm-hmm. and um sort of you know with the, the main overarching theme of this mountain therapy to veterans and first that's of all. awesome and i know personally just from my experience that it's very therapeutic being outdoors but i've never really experienced anything where animals are involved like that and i know animals are therapeutic on their own i mean goats have their own personalities and you know there's goat yoga out there and all sorts of yes. different ways that people use animals for therapy have you noticed a big difference between recreating outdoors and recreating outdoors with goats? Yes, absolutely. I think so. so Some of it was on purpose. Now the goats, you know, the goat idea really stumbled in and just sort of like put the icing on the cake and was above and beyond. But you know, the, the, the main idea behind the project originally was that I wanted to do something that um, the things that helped me through PTSD, I believed in. Right. And, and I think a lot of us recognize whether you've had PTSD or not, what, you know, that just these are things that help you stabilize your life, make you feel better. They're things that that, you know, that we need as as men and or women um, you know, to kind of help, you know, our headspace. 
and the main ones that helped me with PTSD was the outdoors. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just really, really getting outdoors and remembering the things that I love to do. And that so many different things outside, you know, within that being active, uh, getting, getting your butt off the couch. And, you know, a lot of veterans were at one time considered athletes and a whole lot of them handful of years after getting out there, they wouldn't call themselves athletes, anymore, you know? And so sort of just whatever, regardless of what it is being active. And because we hike out there, we're not riding mules. There's an active component there's, and it can be relatively challenging sometimes on purpose, not too much, but a little bit of, you know, and then, um, the brotherhood or, you know, the, the partnership sitting around and talking about hunting stories and fishing stories and what they love about the outdoors, what conservation means to them or what, you know, what is going on with, you know, some lady they got to deal with at work, whatever it is, just that campfire mentality, which is in a lot of ways what a podcast, you know, sort of, uh, it, you know, kind of is, is just kind of sort of talking about life and experiences and different things. But that, you know, a lot of times we don't, uh, we don't recognize how, uh, important that can be to, to helping, you know, some folks' well-being. A lot of guys, you know, they get in this work regime and they, they've got a couple of people they work with, but outside of that, they don't have like-minded folks that they can sit around and chat about. It doesn't have to be woe is me stuff. 99% of the time it's not, you know, sometimes yeah. that is important. But then the last thing, the icing on the cake was the dang, uh, the animal therapeutic nature, which I've always been an animal person. I've always been huge in animals. Um, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm definitely uh, an animal lover in all different walks and, you know, whether it's snakes or lizards or beetles or, or goats or you name it, and dogs. Um, but the, the animal side of it, the, the therapeutic nature, uh, therapeutic aspect of goats, um, really was surprised. It surprised. It has surprised a whole lot of rough and tumble you know army ranger comes out like yeah we're gonna eat the goat at noon today <laughs> and you know on the way home on the way back out they're like can you see a postcard with ranger's picture on it you know <laughs> all in love with the with the goats and and so all of it combined uh going back to your original question i do feel um in in all different levels and all different ways we see lots of signs of it making positive impacts in ourselves i mean we our staff my my uh the staff associated with myself we get as much out of it as anybody i mean this is sort of all most of our sort of side hobbies and uh, so we get a ton out of it but we definitely see everything from guys just being reminded of the things that they love to do how important some of those things for them whether they make big changes in their life or not, probably, you know, with one weekend, maybe it doesn't have a huge impact, but we have, we have, we've also seen huge impacts. We've seen, you know, people that lost weight, you know, after coming and seeing us and on the next trip, they're in better shape and they are in better shape and becoming more active, getting some things, you know, some of their headspace squared back away. We've gotten people way, way more back into the outdoors than what they used to be. We've, you know, what do they call it? Late onset hunting. We've, uh, we've, we've caused some, some folks to get into hunting that weren't into hunting, you know, before. So lots of different things. And really I could see a little bit of that. Hope Stephen doesn't mind me saying it, but I, I think, um, Stephen didn't have a huge background in hunting, but his mm-hmm. first trip was a turkey hunt and, uh, it, which we weren't successful with him, but <laughs> I think that had a huge impact on him thinking, wow, there really is something to this. Maybe, uh, you know, you don't have to grow up being taught this. You can learn this later on and, and really enjoy it. So, Yeah. When he was on our podcast, he talked a little bit about that, um, about how he didn't grow up hunting and his first yeah. kind of foray into hunting was, uh, actually squirrels that were eating yes. his fruit trees in Houston. Yep. So he wasn't really big and growing up in it, but, uh, he seems like he really enjoys it now, but I didn't know that y'all had gone on a turkey hunt, uh, yeah. with his first trip with y'all. That's, that's pretty cool to know. Yeah. Turkey hunt. And then even, uh, we sort of set him up to have a chance at a DIY bear hunt, which was going to be tough. I mean, that, you yeah. know, those, <laughs> that's, I mean, like you could be the best hunter in the world and, and, you know, struggle there. So it wasn't probably the best way to him, for him to learn. Hunt. But I think the turkey hunt, he did enjoy because we did hear some birds and we did, we got to walk around and see some really pretty country. And I think he, you know, I could, you could see the wheels spinning. That's sort of how that works. And a lot of times, um, you know, they got to be successful within, you know, a first handful of hunts. Otherwise you'll be like, well, why are we even doing this? Um, yeah. but otherwise, yeah, I definitely can see some, some of that with him. So, 
That's awesome. So you talked a little bit about the goats and their personalities and stuff like that. So there's one goat in specific when I was, you know, looking at your channel and stuff like that, that the name came up a few times. So uh, can you tell us a little bit about your goat, Juan? Yes, Juan. <laughs> so Juan uh, is uh, <clears throat> originally the first two pack goats that I got was Juan and Pablo. And my son's named Juan and Pablo. You notice that the rest of my goat string for the most part are all military names, but the first two, my son's named. And, and so those names stuck, you know, when your boys mm. name an animal, you just go with it. But I right. named my first two goats, Juan and Pablo. And, um, <laughs> they were, when I first brought them home, they were, they weren't very tame. Um, but they're, I saw their mom and their dad and they were, they were huge. And, you know, that's one thing that you need to have is big goats. So I was excited about them, got them tamed down and everything else. We lost Pablo. Um, uh, he got in the green shed, actually a handful of them did. And, and he didn't make it. He got, uh, foundered, foundered. Um, but anyways, so then after him, well, so they were both pretty good pack goats, but after then Juan were really kind of came in his own, not, not that he, you know, needed to get away from his brother or anything, but, um, Juan has sort of been the kind of poster child. Every time we go to events, well, we've had kids on him and taking pictures. So many people are like, I've never seen a goat that big. I didn't know goats could get that big. And, um, he's just, you know, he really is the number one, one, we call him one, one, um, <laughs> for, of the goat herd. And uh, now if we're going uphill for a long period of time, he doesn't lead the pack string because he is a little thick. And his cardio will start going down and he'll let some of the <laughs> other goats pass him. Um, but uh, if, you know, as long as, as long as it, it, you know, we're not going too fast or anything like that. Yeah. He doesn't let anyone pass him. He's, he's big Papa bear and everyone else in the goat string knows it. So That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I saw a couple guys talking about him saying that they're his favorite goat. And I even saw a little clip of him getting down on his knees to eat. <laughs> yes. Yes. That goofy goat. He'll go straight down on his front legs on his knees and yeah, just to get after any lecture, a little more. So, oh, there's one piece of corn down here. I got to get. So he didn't get that big by being picky and he is not picky. No. Yeah, yeah. That's he's awesome. a little boy. Yeah. Jose used to have goats when he was younger. <laughs> yeah. They were punks though, man. Dude, I'll tell you what, goats are, goats are crafty. We, um, yes, they are for my, there's a research ranch we go out to and, um, they have multi-species grazing. They have, cattle sheep and goats and we have gps calls on the on the animals on the few animals and uh every now and again we'll have to go out there we'll have to corral them run them up remove the collars download the data and then put them back on and everything so we were out there one day and the goats are pretty food oriented so they're not if they're being if they're feeling cooperative they don't they don't give us too much of a hard time we can get them pinned up in like an hour or so once we find them finding them is a hard part because like a, it's like a 5,000 acre ranch. I mean, we just got to drive around until we find them. And, and uh, every now and again, we'll get lucky. They're like by the gate or whatever. But found these goats. And then they happen to be close to these older pins. God knows how old those pins are. But they're pretty. Uh, they've seen some years. They've seen, they've seen better days. And uh, so we got them pinned up there. And it was a fiasco. It took us probably three hours to get them in there. And so we still had tracked down. The cattle, I think the sheep were off the ranch at this point, so we didn't have to worry about them. So we got them pinned up. We're like, we'll deal with them when we when we finish the cattle. We found the cattle. We got them all wrapped up in like an hour or so. I went back to the pens, and we see all the goats walking down the road. There's just one little lone goat sitting in the middle of the pen. We're like, what the hell? And so we tried, man. We we went around. We, we could not figure out how they got out. All the gates were shut. There were no visible holes in the fences like in, in the in the pins like nothing they just they were just gone and so we were at that point of the day we we're done man we we're so frustrated so we just left and then the first, luckily in the morning they were they're were pretty pretty close to where we had left them uh or we where we had last seen them so uh, again we were able to round them up this time they knew what was going on so they fought us a little harder it took us about three and a half four hours to get them back in the pins but dude it was it was a mess i I like goats, but I'm also not a fan because of how much of a pain they can be. Because they are they're 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 smart animals. They're crafty, and, mm -hmm. and to this day, we have no idea, no idea how they got out of those pins. Yeah, they're really good at 
figuring out ways to get in places that you don't want them. And, you know, most time, like my goats, they're never going to go far, but they, I have had to become a master at mending, finding issues with fencing constantly. Um, any, everything from, I've got two La Manchas that are really tall. They're about 200 pounds, but they're, they're, they're tall and lanky and they can clear five, a little over five foot pretty easily. Like it's, nothing that's crazy and which is a pain in the butt you know most of us don't fence it above five foot you know usually between four and five foot and so your t-posts aren't the right size your fencing isn't the right size so you're putting barbed wire up and and getting extra t-posts it's a it's a huge pain and then really the reason why i lost um juan's brother was because um one of the la figured out how to open up a side latch you know that you have to go up sideways and then down and then pull on the door. He figured that out, opened it up, but he wasn't the biggest goat Juan and Pablo were. So they kicked his butt out of there and they ate most of the grain. And, and, uh, cause I, I mean, I almost lost five of them, but, um, um, cause they, I mean, like they, ate, uh, I don't even know how much, probably 50 pounds of grain at one oh, wow. So stupid. Yeah, they will. That's another thing. I, 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 in a lot of ways I'll say goats are way smarter than people realize. But in that one aspect, they're not. They'll eat enough to kill them. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I tend to engorge myself when it comes to food. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is true. Yeah, they'll try to hurt themselves. So, ding dongs. You got to. You definitely got to keep them. Keep an eye on any potential things. Of course, getting on vehicles. And I've mm-hmm. got some Nigerian dwarfs that I use for outreach, which are you know tiny little goats. Yeah. And even those little goats, man, they can jump on a four wheel drive pickup truck and be on the on the cab and, you know, and, and blink of an eye. It's That's enough crazy. to climb up that stuff. So, yeah, I've seen goats on like roofs of houses and I mean, you can find yeah. freaking yep. everywhere. Yep. It, it never ceases to amaze me on the places they can end up in trees. You know, you go down to South Texas, mm-hmm. you'll be driving through and they'll be up in some, you know, we satch or some Oak trees down there, just kind of hanging out on a sideways limb. <laughs> it's like, yes. Okay. It's like the leaves yeah. probably taste better up there. <laughs> yeah. yeah, they're really good at climbing, which, you know, for pack goading, it really helps. You know, that's mm-hmm. one thing is, is people ask, you know, where can you take them? And the the question is, or the reality of it is anywhere you, you can go without repelling equipment, the goats are not going to have any issue. Going. That's awesome. So you don't have to, you don't have to fight to take them pretty much anywhere. Uh, water now, you know, if you in in uh, Arkansas, we deal with a lot of river crossings, you know, kind of year round. You know, the Ozarks and the Washington's are just there's streams everywhere and goats notoriously don't like water. Um, so I start out all of my young ones in the summer. I'll go wade fishing and just take them with me. And before too long, they have no choice but to cross the river, you know, 700 times. And by yeah. then they're swimming and they don't. Uh, they don't care, but a lot of folks, you know, like out West, I, I've posted videos of some of the goats, of some of my goats swimming across the stream and they're just, you know, these, these folks out in Colorado, they're just mind blown because they can't even get their goats to go over a puddle, you know, <laughs> that's sort of their mentality. And, yeah. uh, was because, you know, in Arkansas, we were constantly dealing with water, and rain and, 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 uh, so take them wade fishing, man. That's the way to do it. That makes sense. So yeah. in the process of taming them, is that something where you just kind of take them out and do what they're going to be doing and force them to do it? And, you know, over time they just get used to it or what's that whole process of taking a baby goat and making them ready for going out? So the stuff? biggest, the, they're way easier to train than probably 90% of people would ever recognize them. Most of the stuff you really need them to do, they come, it comes to them naturally. The first step is they just have to be tamed. If they've been bottle fed, they're already tamed. You know, there's nothing to them. If they're not bottle fed, then while they're younger, um, they usually, a couple months after they come off mom and they're weaned, a handful of months, they'll they'll be kind of halfway tame. And then there'll be a couple of months there where you got to watch them because they'll start getting where they just don't like people as much. Not all, but a whole lot of damn raised goats will. And during that time, you just want to make sure that you know, you never get mad at them and kick at them or do anything to really ruin that trust and try to, you know, spend some time with them. If you can see them at least 10 minutes every day, that helps a ton. And by the time they're, you know, six months old, 
they're usually calm back down and kind of come back around. And then once they're tame, then it's super easy. I could take, you know, if, if you, if you have a friend that has goats at their house, it's never left the farm, but they're tame. I could load them up with my goats and I promise you I could take them all over the mountains and they're not going to have any issue because really? goats follow you better than part of the reason. One of the biggest reasons why they're about the best pack animal, in my opinion, obviously I'm biased, hugely biased, but nonetheless is because they, they naturally follow you, you know, just about every other pack animal, you know, one out of four, one out of five, like does not want to follow you or they just go through spells where they don't, they won't listen Goats are going to follow you. You cannot, I mean, like you cannot leave your goat as long as he's tamed. He's, they're going to follow you. Um, naturally they, it's, you know, it's, it's in their DNA to just follow the, the leader. They don't want to be the last goat. So they'll fight. They'll keep shuffling on who's right <laughs> behind you. And, uh, you got to try to keep them from passing you. They'll try to pass you if they think that you know where you're going. Um, they don't want to be wolf bait. So they don't want to be last, but you kind of get, a, get that out of them. And they follow you really easily. So the first step is, you know, the harder parts is getting them to load up in a trailer, unload from the trailer, um, you know, sitting on a leash or hanging out on a leash. Um, Cause you know, when you get to camp, you're going to leash them up and at night you're going to leash them up. There's a lot of different situations, you know, where you might need to leash them. So you leash train them, but they're way easier to leash train than a dog. Their instinct isn't to go exploring and pulling on that leash and, everything else their their instinct is once they learn that they can't pull away from the leash their instinct is well let's just walk wherever i guess wherever we're going that's where we're going so um most of it's easy about one of the hardest things to teach pack goats is to have camp manners because uh you'll be over there feet you know kicked up by the fire eating dinner drinking a beer whatever you're doing and next thing you know there's a goat in your tent you know, eating a sleep bag <laughs> and uh, cause they're tame, right? They love you and they want to be around you. And if you're not paying attention, they, they can tear up camp really quick. So that can be an art. There's lots of different techniques. Um, I have a little dog that I hunt with. That's also trained to kind of help keep the goats back. He'll go dive bombing at the goats, kind of pushing back. You can squirt bottle them out of camp. And then once they get to be two or three, they usually learn it and they, they're pretty good about staying out of camp. Although Juan every now and then will just decide he's going to come in and flop right down next to the campfire. And, uh, <laughs> if he's not getting in trouble, I'll let him slide. But usually he's just waiting for that opportunity when you're not paying attention. So he can get into the bag of tortillas or you know, whatever. So, <laughs> so is it true that goats will really eat basically anything? It's not true. Um, yeah, that's one of the big misconceptions. They will eat now. They will eat just about any type of plant matter that has ever been made. Cardboard boxes. They will literally eat it. And uh, so we talk about this in one of the classes I I teach when we're talking about enzymes and digestion. But they actually can get energy. They they're getting some uh, energetic calories, not a lot, but a little bit of calories out of paper and cardboard because it's cellulose and they can break that down into a small amount of calories. Probably mm -hmm. not good to just feed your goat copious amounts of cardboard, but nonetheless, it's not hurting them. Um, they'll eat leaves and then, you know, just about any plant out there, they eat bark, um, a lot of different bark, but everything revolves around plant matter outside of that. You know, if it's, if it's fat based, um, or if it's protein, you know, if it's meat, they're pretty much not going to touch it. And then where they can have problems is like cushions and seat cushions on a motorcycle, four wheeler tr tractor, anything out there. They just like chewing on it, just like a puppy or whatever. And so they'll get on there and start nibbling and tearing it up. And people, you know, they'll get called out for eating that or whatever. They test a lot of things with their mouth, you know, so you might see one like nibble the side of a, of a, a beer can laying on the side. of it. You know, mine don't cause they've been out there enough, but you kind of get the idea. So I think that's where that mentality comes from. Uh, I see. That makes sense. So you've talked a little bit about, you know, your teaching and stuff like that. And uh, so what subject do you teach? Do you teach biology? I do. I teach, um, I mainly teach intro biology classes. I've taught some anatomy, some physiology, um, this next semester I'm teaching, uh, introduction to conservation biology, pretty excited about that class. Um, but most everything goes back to biology. I'm the subject, uh, area coordinator, which means that like 
I have to make decisions on which textbook and what, what, you know, directions the classes go and make sure that all of our, uh, all of our biology classes look pretty similar and meet the standards or whatever. So I'm pretty heavy on the biology side. Yeah. That's awesome. And so that kind of goes along with what, you know, your, your PhD is in, isn't it? Yes. 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 Yeah, definitely fits my background. That's why a lot of the, you know, I'm excited about that, that intro biology class. So the last chapter in my intro biology class is uh, the chapter that's termed conservation biology. And it's sort of um, my capstone lecture. You know, that last lecture, I've got a really cool video uh, that uh, Forest Service and TNC sort of film that talks about conservation and lizards and glades and whatnot. And uh, then, you know, so the, the, the class, the chapter does this and I sort of follow the same thing, but the first section of the, the first half of the chapter there's a lot of bad news, a lot of doom and gloom, you know, this sort of how mm-hmm. conservation, there's a lot of negative things out there. We're talking about climate change and loss of species and, you know, all these other things. But then the second half of the chapter is about the things that we're doing to improve that one, things that we can do and different concepts that relate around that. And so you kind of get to sprinkle some of the happiness in it. And then at the end of this semester, well, I'm selling all the students. You need. Now, if that was fun, take intro uh, to conservation biology. So. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. So you mentioned glades. So didn't you do a podcast with the Ozark podcast guys talking about yes. glades? Yes, we did. Yes. Um, Kyle and Kyle. Yeah. Um, that was, yeah, the Kyle. So that was a fun, that was a fun podcast. They um, were, they had been interested in glades and mm-hmm. not necessarily just color lizards, but they knew a little bit about color lizards and they knew a little bit about this and that. And so it was sort of a perfect time. And when they reached out to me, they're like, man, we, you know, you haven't done like a Glade podcast. Why don't you do a Glade po- podcast around that? So the reason why my background's heavy with Glades is because the, the, the model species that I um, did my dissertation on uh, their, their primary habitat are Glades. And so, I've had to become pretty acquainted with and, and learn a lot about. And then all of my conservate, most of my conservation work that I do now revolves around that glade habitat, restoring it and improving it. So I see. That's awesome. Yeah. I was one of those guys that I didn't know what a glade was prior to that episode. You know, I would just think glade, Oh, Everglades, you know, that's the first thing that came to yes. mind. So yeah. I actually learned a lot from that episode and we don't got to go into that because you've already done a whole podcast on it. But for those of y'all that are listening, it's a very interesting listen. So go check out the Ozark podcast, listen to his episode. You'll learn a lot. So, but, so you do a lot of stuff and, and have done a lot of research in biology. So Jose is kind of in the midst of doing the same thing. And you talked about field work before we got on the podcast. So what does your field work typically look like? So most of the stuff that I do nowadays is going to revolve around, well, um, population assessments on Eastern collared lizards. Um, and so I'll go and look at, so I've got some populations that I, that we have, uh, reintroduced. And so I've got to assess that population. How much recruitment do we have this year? How many adults from the previous year are left behind are you know, still there? So sort of aspects around that. Um, so that's going to be a whole lot of it. And then I also work in a molecular ecology lab. And so tied with this collar lizard project is, is keeping track of um, uh, sort of population structure, the, how the um, how much gene flow. Uh, there is how much migration there is, um, what, uh, which individuals seem to have more offspring, have better recruitment success, because that relates back to where their source w- was from. So I'm reintroducing them from another place or from a captive uh, propagation program that we have in central Arkansas, the Little Rock Zoo, um, where they have some lizards. So we're keeping track of a lot of those different things. So I'm getting toe tissue samples, moving some lizards around. Getting if it's a new habitat site, sort of assessing how close are we to being able to reintroduce this one, making assessments for the land manager uh, or um, and recommendations. You know, hey, I think we're real close. We need another fire on the ground, and and you know, in the next year or two, we might be able to reintroduce lizards. You know, that kind of thing. So that's awesome. So, what's the process of taking lizards that were raised in captivity 
and releasing them in the wild. And and I ask this because when I was younger, I used to capture a lot of green anoles uh-huh. and I would catch them in my backyard, keep them in a tank for a while. And at one point they started breeding, which I guess yes. that means that I was, you know, creating a, uh, right. a you know, a, yeah. a nice habitat for them inside. But yeah. I started getting too many of them. So I started releasing them back outside. And I always wondered, like, are they surviving? Is it possible to survive? <laughs> because I never yeah. like hand fed them or anything like that. I would, yeah. you know, put mealworms and crickets and let them find their own food. But yeah. I just wasn't sure how successful they would be if they're born or raised in captivity and then reintroduced outside. Yeah. So in general, um, most... It, you know, it's going to be very species specific, but, it, it, you know, painting with a broad brush, animals that are born in captivity have lower survival rates once they are released into the wild. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just the nature of it. Um, there's probably I'm sure there's exceptions to that, but on average. And so and we we uh, suspect, uh, I mean, I don't have enough data right now to to really pinpoint how different it is. But we suspect that, yeah, the that the the lizards that are bred from captivity are not going to have the survival rates, not going to have, you know, be quite as robust, but they are still surviving. And um, the biggest thing, you know, when you think about, uh, you know, what, what you're trying to do, what we're trying to do is get a much higher survival rate in captivity with the amount of, you know, let's say we have two females and let's say on average, they would have, you know, 30 eggs a piece. Well, in the wild, out of those 30 eggs, probably one or two from each individual would make it to be, an, you know, a yearling that next year. Well, mm-hmm. we can we can supplement that. We can get that close to 100 percent. So it gives us a whole bunch of lizards. Now, are they going to have the survival rate that those other lizards that were born in the wild have? Almost never. No. I mean, probably n- not even half. But even if you had a quarter of that, that would still be out of 60 lizards. You know, you still got. 15 of them instead of just the two. And so sort of the idea is be able to throw a, you know, a larger number, even if you're going to lose more at, at these sites. And then we also will follow it up the following year. We'll go ahead and grab some wild caught animals, a handful of wild caught animals that gives the, those that originally came from captivity, a chance to, to find a territory and sort of sort out who's going to make it through the next year. If they make it through that that first year, they're probably going to be in pretty good shape. And then when you bring in the more sort of redneck, tougher, you know, the ones that have been around the block a few times with a scar <laughs> on their eye and whatnot, they're going to kick their butts. Now they've got a puncher's chance. And hopefully you can kind of keep a, a stable starting point for that population. And then if that takes on, well, then... You know, with lizards, just like a lot of, you know, smaller, shorter generation time animals, if you can get them sort of started and stabilized, they usually do fine and take off. I see. That's kind of how that dynamic is. Yeah. That's awesome. So if you take captive bred lizards and they're interacting and commingling with wild lizards, is that something where, and I don't know how it works with instinct and and, and how things go with predation. So obviously if they're in captivity, they're not going to have as much of an issue with predation as, you know, obviously on the wild. Is that something that they can learn from the lizards that were, you know, wild born or is that kind of an instinctual thing? I think it's more of an instinctual thing. And I think with, you know, a species like this, I don't think they're going to learn or teach any, you know, any of the others. Um, it'd be cool if they would, you know, right. I think, I think they really learn, um, about predators and how to survive. Um, and it's in, in the first two weeks, if they make it for the past those first two weeks, they're probably in pretty good shape. But in the first two weeks, if they, if they sit there and have a delayed response when a hawk comes in and they're food and they're yeah. done, right? And there's no more learning. You know, they learned, yeah, you know, and then it's over. <laughs> they, don't, um, they don't survive. <laughs> yeah, they don't survive. <laughs> but I think once they get past that, then they have enough instincts. And, and if they're getting enough food, which, you know, in this, in this system, food is not a limiting factor. They've got more food than they could ever. It's all about not getting, you know, eaten in the process of getting that food, making sure you find the right place to, to spend the night so that critters don't get you and mm-hmm. overwintering, you know, is a big one is do they go to the, um, when, when the winter hits, they've got to get below the frost line. And we have, we put them in a habitat that has all the things they need, but I'm not telling them and showing them where they, each one needs to go. 
And I think we probably lose some that just because they weren't born in that habitat. And, you know, because like you think from where they hatched from, if they were a wild lizard, from where they hatched from, if they went there for the winter, they'd probably be fine. Right. Yeah. But these animals don't know that for sure. So we don't know what cues tell them. And so we wonder if we may lose some that just pick the wrong spot to try to overwinter. Yeah. But again, we're, I mean, we're still getting reasonable survival rates over, you know, that first year higher than I anticipated originally, which suggests to me that there's enough instincts there that they, they kind of pick up on it, you know? So that's so cool. So we kind of got off the rails, you know, we talked yeah. a little bit about how we're probably going to do that in this podcast. So I guess we'll kind of get back <laughs> to the snake, <laughs> the snake mountain pack goats. So you, you spoke earlier saying that uh, you, you suffer from PTSD. Were, did you serve? Yes, I served in Iraq in uh, 03, 04, and then again in 07, 08. Okay. So, well, first of all, thank you for your service. You know, we're big yeah. supporters of the military. And uh, yeah, so is that something that kind of also made you want to do more for the community of veterans? Yes, I think um, the... The whole reason why I started the the Pat Go project again, you know, you know, initially or the the main thing was that those were that I well let me back up. So I struggled quite a bit when we when we came back from overseas, like ninety percent of of veterans, and then of course you know like a lot of folks, whether they served or not, you know, you go through your early mid twenties and it's it's like trying to just solve life, you know, yeah. in today's day and age, it's it's very similar, um, at least on that in that level. And what things that, that I, I got through it, right? I had different things that helped me get through it. I ended up going to school, I ended up being, uh, uh, working on my PhD, um, getting a hold of my life, you know, uh, getting away from some bad habits and, and improving things. And then, and looking back, you know, 10, 12, 15 years down the road, what were the things that helped? And it was that outdoor therapy, that, that mountain therapy, being active and those type of things. But also, I had served with a couple of different organizations, actually rode uh, with a motorcycle club that served veterans. I liked riding motorcycles, and in some ways, that fit me. It had the brotherhood. It had serving other veterans, and shoot, it's hard to beat riding a motorcycle with a bunch of other cool guys. You know? Yeah. But it didn't have the, 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 you know, being active. It didn't have the outdoors. It didn't have the mountain therapy. So it was still not – it wasn't it wasn't everything I wanted. So when I stopped doing that, I realized I still wanted to serve veterans in some capacity. I still wanted to show folks some of the things that helped me get through my hard times and the things that helped me. Because, you know, a lot of my brothers, you know, struggled, you know, uh, and and um, maybe took longer to kind of get out of that or, and or still aren't, you know, out of that slump, you know, yeah. to be honest. You know, it, it, everybody's different and the different levels on that. And, and this mountain therapy model won't help everybody. Absolutely. You know, some folks, it's just not their thing, but I think a whole lot more, it will help than even, I think a lot of times one of the biggest things that tells me it's working is when somebody comes out and they, and it, it's just, they recognize these are the things that they used to do that they appreciated, even though we don't love getting up at 3 a.m., to go do push-ups outside and do, you know, military stuff and go, go living out in the dang swamps and, you know, living, being in the woods all the time and being active and all these other things, even though at the time it didn't seem like that was so important to you when you sort of kind of go back into it and you're in control of it and do it as you like it and how you want. A lot of guys realize, wow, yeah, I do like that. And that does help me. And that gives them something to show their kids and to, you know, to have camaraderie, some other brothers, some different friends that they might not have, a new connection that they have, and just sort of fills a whole lot of niches from, you know, that therapeutic side. So. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, it's one thing that I never even really thought about. Like, I know that obviously going out and doing stuff, and there's different forms of therapy, you know, for people that have, that have suffered and, and suffer from PTSD, but I never thought about the fact that you were forced to do it before. So there's automatically going to be that resistance, but doing the same thing under your own power. I didn't think that that would, you know, I never crossed my mind that that could be like a huge thing. Uh, yes. that was therapeutic for you doing those same activities, but not being forced to do them. So, yes. Yeah. I think, I think a really good example is um, I think there's a lot of veterans that would tell you they don't love 
um, going to the range. The military has a way of making the range miserable. And yeah. I was one of those um, that most of the time I went to the range, I didn't enjoy it. I just, it was no fun. You yelled at, you're in line. It took all day long to make 50 shots. I mean, there's just so many different things they would do to that making the range time no fun, right? Yeah. And I think there's probably a lot of vets kicking around that have no desire to have firearms and don't go back into shoot most most do, right? <laughs> we reckon, but but there's still I think there's a fraction that don't just because they're like I was so miserable on the range. I don't ever want to do that again. I don't want to <laughs> sit behind and you know it's like it's hard to imagine. But whenever you, now you're in charge of it. And you do it how you want to. And you remember some of the things that you were taught that are ingrained in you that that makes you pretty darn skilled, regardless of your background. You're probably pretty darn skilled at marks. Um, those guys, you know, then then it is sort of that full circle where you realize, OK, it's pretty cool. And and I think that applies to a lot of different things that we do uh, that fits with, you know, from a therapeutic side. So what does the process look like when y'all go on a trip? So you, you mentioned earlier, you bring the goats on a trailer. And so do you just have everything packed up, unload the goats, load up the goats and just hit the trail or, or how does that work? Yeah. So the, um, the groups re- really vary a lot. The number of people anywhere from five to six to 14 or 15, you know, people that were taken. And so we have to get our weight together for all the goats and the amount of gear. Um, Cause we're going to, you know, we're going to almost glamp, what they call it glamping or car camping, <laughs> you know, sort of, um, you know, we'll, we'll, the goats can carry a lot of extra stuff. So we're going to eat really good meals, campfire meals. Um, a guy named, uh, Doc James is, is our, uh, camp cook and he's gotten experience like doing outdoor wild, uh, wild game meals around the campfire. Mm-hmm for dinners and breakfasts. And so we might be carrying 80 to 150, I think one time 160 pounds of food, um, oh, wow. you know, that the goats were carrying. Right. So, um, get all the food stored away, get everything, make sure that we're not missing anything and then load all the goat saddlebags. The, I usually will do it the weekend before, cause I'm usually working all the way up to Friday. Mm-hmm. Um, when we go to leave, um, get all that loaded up, everything set aside besides the foods, keep that in the freezer, load it up Friday morning, get that all loaded in. And then we clown car the goats into um, a horse trailer. When I say clown car, anybody that messes with pack goats knows that's how they prefer to be hauled. Um, (laughs) So a two horse um, trailer can easily hold 10 goats. Um, I mean, they, they, that's how they like to load up. They, they ride better. They can just stand there and kind of lean on each other as as you go around (laughs) corners and whatnot. So you clown car them into the back of the, the truck and then, get to the trailhead. Well, with us, we'll, we'll do a, uh, a convoy briefing, a safety briefing, you know, have folks, you know, make sure they have all the gear they need there at the, at the farm before we leave and then uh, load the goats up, head out there. And it does take probably a good 20 minutes, 25 minutes to get all the goats saddles on all their bags on everything set up. And then we, from there, we hike in anywhere from two to, Five miles, six miles is about the farthest we usually ever go uh, mm-hmm. back in there. Um, set up base camp and then and then do whatever activities we got set aside for for that trip. Um, that's awesome. Yeah, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. So you're you're talking about the the cooking wild game. I saw a video earlier of y'all making some bear burgers. Yes. How are those? Oh, dude, bear burgers are are legit. No, they're really good. Yeah. I've only ever had bear in a stew and it was really good, but it also had Sandhill crane in it. So, you know, oh, I, I yeah. couldn't really tell between the two. I just know yeah. that whatever was in the stew was amazing. It was good stuff. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of things out there that are surprisingly good. Uh, Bobcat mm-hmm. is really good. Um, really? Yeah. Yeah. It's surprisingly good. I've had, I've had Bobcat chili and coyote chili. I've had Bobcat and coyote chili. And I couldn't tell the difference. I, I had just enough Bobcat to know. The bobcat's good. The coyote, I don't, I don't know. It still tasted good with the bobcat and all the other stuff that was in there. Yeah. Um, water buffalo, elk, deer, bear, uh, lots of squirrel, rabbit. Um, there, yeah, there's not too many things that we haven't tried. That's and awesome. dude, like this guy can make anything taste good. So I have to like take <laughs> it with a grain of salt. Like maybe I don't want to go shoot a coyote and, and like you know put it in the freezer myself. But if he does it, and somehow it's good, man. So, <laughs> yeah, he's really good at what he does. Um, and we do fish tacos. 
Um, so one of our, uh, when we first started out, one of our sort of potential, we, we, you know, this project really started, um, we, we founded the nonprofit, but we didn't know exactly how the model would be kind of what I've described Friday morning to Sunday. And we have one base camp, we don't move. And but we didn't know exactly how this would look. We didn't even know yeah. that for sure. And, um, we had a lot of different ideas. And one of our first ideas was we're going to bring some food out to, uh, uh, to camp, but we're not going to bring enough and we're going to force people to catch the fish, you know, needed to make fish tacos. And we're, they're going to ke- kill the squirrels or whatever it is, right. You're going to eat, you, you've got to go harvest, you know, and you can see it's a pretty cool idea. That sounds great. Sounds like a great idea until you don't get the amount of food yeah. and then you're way out in the middle of nowhere. Everybody's <laughs> starving. So we did that. Um, and, and we, I think the first two or three times we did where our main meals were going to be fish tacos or something fish, we had no issue. We caught fish, no problem. But I think about the third or fourth time we had a group of 13 of us and the fish were not biting and we were really struggling to get fish. And dude, I was flaying like little sunfish that were like an inch and <laughs> quarter long, like trying to get fillet. Dude, I was filleting any, like people would bring some of them, like, it's kind of a fish, I'll fillet it, you know? And we got <laughs> Dude, we were trying to get some protein in that. And uh, we probably had enough to feed like two people and we split it between like 13 of us. And then after Jeez. that, yeah, after that, we're like, maybe that part of the project isn't that important. Maybe there's other ways of doing this. Yeah. So, um, yeah, we, uh, we, since then we bring in our food, the amount of food we need. So. <laughs> <laughs> Do y'all still hunt and fish though, to where y'all, y'all can harvest what, what y'all catch, but it's not a necessity. Yes. Yeah. Essentially that's how we do it now is, um, we'll, we'll plan aside, um, meals so that, um, if we, and, and bring the fixings to do, like say we, you know, we do kill a mess of squirrels. We, we have squirrels tonight because we did, and we'll just save that other food, you know, which is a gotcha. much better model, yeah. much, much better model. And same thing with fish and fish tacos and, and yeah, yeah you name it. Now, you, you know, usually like, you know, if we harvest a bear, we're out all night long, just trying to get, you know, all of that <laughs> taken care of. Cause it's always hot in Arkansas during early bear season. Yeah. And, uh, so, you know, we don't, we don't plan on eating, you know, anything that we kill, you know, during like bear, bear season, usually early deer season is not that way. Um, yeah. but some of the season, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll go ahead and have both. So that's available. awesome. Yeah. yeah I yeah. think I'm going to go on a bear hunt and uh, film a bear hunt september this year and i'm super excited for that I, yeah. i've i've had an unofficial invite and uh so we'll see how that plans out but i've never been bear hunting but i'm excited just to yeah, be a yeah. part of the experience and, and help is. out and, and yeah. bears themselves are just magnificent creatures and i've had it like i said in a stew um and the guy that said i can go with him said if he does harvest one that he'll let me have some of the meat and i'm just excited to try it different yeah. ways I'm yeah. super excited for that. But yeah, he was telling me when the season is, it's like early September. I was like, yeah, it's still be kind of hot. <laughs> it's hot. Oh yeah. It's hot, but it's a lot of fun. I mean, even if we never harvest anything, I would, I, I just love, you know, everything that goes all revolves around, you know, sort of scouting for them and getting, mm-hmm. you get pictures of bears, man. It's, you know, it's pretty legit. Get them on the cell camera and you know sitting there at the house board and you're like, well, I wonder what Baloo is doing today. Oh yeah, he's there at the bait right now. <laughs> you know, just all the things that go in with bear is awesome. You know, it's not about. It's a little bit different. You, I mean, you're there trying to harvest one, mm-hmm. um, but it's it's not like deer season where if you don't, it's a it's a bust. You know, yeah. and it's not like fishing or, or a lot of other things. Like you're probably there's a lot of people that will you know have never killed a bear and and may never kill one or kill one, you know, I've killed yeah. one, you know, and, uh, and so, you know, it's not something that you're going to, you're going to lot a lot of numbers on, but if you can still fall in love with everything else that goes within it, it's, it's a really, it's a really fun sport. So. Yeah. I've heard a lot of people get addicted to the experience, whether yeah. they harvest one or not. Yeah. Yeah. Just seeing them are, is, is enough for me. Yeah. I mean, like, you know, I mean, people run around the woods like just in Arkansas on the Ozarks, and hike all the time and everything else. And I've never seen a bear, you know? Yep. So of course, you know, I've, I've got, I've had the privilege and been able to see several 
but it's still, you know, it's, uh, I'm doing things specifically to try to put myself in position to be able to see one. And it's usually, yeah. you know, they're, they're gone just as fast as you saw them. So, yeah. yeah. I've only ever seen one. I was driving to Camden, um, for the nature of my work. Uh, I have systems in Camden and white County and East Arkansas, all over Arkansas and, uh, yeah. Tahlequah, Oklahoma, Vicksburg, Mississippi, Longview, Texas. So I go all over the place and I was going to our Camden system one time and I'm driving and it was probably like six o'clock in the morning. Sun was still behind the trees and I'm driving and I, I see something crossing the road up there. I slow down. I was like, Oh, it's just a dog. And I was like, that's a funny looking dog. And I get closer. Yeah. It's like a 200 pound black bear just moseying yeah. across the street. I was like, Oh, yep. that's so cool. The first black bear I've ever seen. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I love seeing them. I, I, uh, the first several that I saw were in, uh, around Mina on uh, Rich Mountain. Mm-hmm. Um, going up the, you know, the, the Tallahena drive and, you know, there's a highway that goes up to real scenic view and whatnot. And I'd yeah. ride my motorcycle over there and, uh, I'd, I'd see him crossing the road or walking down the side of the road, uh, several times before I actually, I mean, I saw several across the road before I ever saw one in the woods. And yeah. then, uh, yeah, it's hard to see him in the, it's a lot harder to see him in the woods than, than just crossing the road or out right. in some big field, you know, you might be able to see him across there kind of on the edge of it. We had one go come right across my driveway. I've got a picture of him in front of my trash can last really? year. Yeah. Last spring. And I've got goats there. Uh, you know, I've got a whole farm. And, uh, so I like seeing him, but I was also a little, I'm like, am I going to see him again? And other right. folks around the, the area saw him, um, but never, never back real close b- back to my place. I never had any issues with him or anything. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. I went and, uh, backpacked, you know, I think we went six miles or something like that over there at the Casa Tot. Oh, and yeah. I know that's bear country over there and I was yes. hoping so bad to see one, but yep. we didn't see any while I was there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that's definitely bear country. I've seen several or several that I have seen are also from right back over in that way. Really? Yeah, yeah that's good. That's area. awesome. Yeah. So how do people get a hold of, hold of y'all and, uh, you know, book trips or, or just find out information about y'all? So we have a website. Um, we're not great at keeping up on it. It's not super up to date. It's relatively up to date. It's, uh, mm-hmm. I don't want to throw my sister under the bus. She's in charge of that. We don't pay for a higher end website, so it doesn't have the bells and whistles that we can adjust as easily and whatnot. But, um, but you know, we have stuff there to kind of keep you posted. It has our email on it and our social media accounts, whatever. That's snakemountainpatgoats.org. Um, okay. But otherwise, all the main social medias, Instagram, TikTok, um, and then our biggest one is Facebook. Most of the stuff we do is off of Facebook. Okay. Um, so that's Snake Mountain Pat Goats. Um, on any of the social media platforms, you find us there and we usually post there on Instagram and Facebook, uh, ahead of time. So folks can know like three months from now, we're going to do, you know, the, the bear hunt or whatever it is. And then about a month out or two months out, we'll put it up. And for big game hunts, we're usually, um, it's a draw only. And, um, and you know, sometimes we'll have 200 people put the name in the hat. We can only take yeah. five or six. Um, but it just, it depends what it is. Our, our non big game stuff is usually there, you know, whoever it's it considered first come first serve. We usually can take 12 or so. And we usually don't work out or, or, you know, we don't turn anyone away. We try not to turn, turn anyone away. So, um, most of our trips folks can hit. It's just like the bear hunt and some of the hog hunts that we have the issue with, um, making sure that, that, um, or we have the issue where we have to do the draw. I see. And then, that makes um, sense. and then our email, you know, I, I do get randomly, you know, a lot of times it's somebody's, you know, it's a spouse and she's like, I ain't heard about y'all and whatever. And can they go and like, you know, if I get a random phone call and I see a voicemail and, and someone asking to be part of the project, then, you know, you don't have to be on social media. I know not everyone's yeah. into that. So any means, any means they necessary, they send me a, a uh, carrier pigeon. I'll try to use that. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll make sure that I put your website in the description, and uh, I'll throw some socials in there too. So, cool. uh, for the yeah. listeners, if if it's something you're interested in helping out with or being a part of, uh, definitely go check them out. I, I think it's a great idea. It's something that I, I would have never thought of people doing, <laughs> and yeah. uh, but it sounds like it's awesome and can be doubly therapeutic being outdoors and having the animals involved. So, yes. I just think it's a yeah. great thing that you're doing. And if there's anything that you know Jose or I can do to help y'all out, I mean, we'll happily do it. Yeah. Well, y'all should come out sometime. Yeah, that'd be fun. You you got a trip coming up this weekend, don't you? 
Yeah. Uh, yes. This coming weekend and it depends on the water. You know, we've had so much rain mm-hmm. that the water levels may be difficult for wading. And if we can't wade, it's not going to be much fun to fish where we, where we're going. Right. Um, it's possible they come down. So if they come down and, and we think we're going to be okay, then we're going to do a fly fishing, smallmouth bass focused, um, you know, fishing trip, uh, yeah. with Steven as our, as our guide and our guru. If that doesn't work out, then we're going to go to, we're probably going to go to Horsehead Lake with a bunch of canoes and just go, we've got a lease over there that we have access to. So uh-huh. at least we can, you know, get people out there fishing. So not what we were planning for, but, um, I mean, the weather, it does not want to stop raining. So, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been nonstop. And yeah. I was talking to one of my, one of my buddies up there, um, from Ozark media up there in Northwest Arkansas. And we're talking about smallmouth fishing up there. And he said that everything's just basically blown out and muddy. So it's yeah. tough for smallmouth fishing. He yeah. said, but he's hoping this yeah. weekend or by next week that it'll clear up a little bit. So, yeah, I've never had much success. My style of fishing, I think is not conducive for when the water is chocolate, chocolate milk, you know, uh, uh-huh. Uh, I know you can still catch them, but I, I usually don't do as well. I usually need a little bit of normal coloration pattern before I, yeah, I start running into them. Steven probably could get after them regardless, but if we can't wade, then it's not going to be much fun. So right, we'll, right. Well, we've got a plan A and a plan B. That's awesome. Well, y'all be safe out there and y'all have fun. And it's been a pleasure having you on. We're kind of coming up on our time, so we got to close her out. But uh, I feel like there's plenty more we can talk about. So if you ever want to hop on on a future episode, talk about anything else. It sounds like you have a lot more up there in that noggin. (laughs) We'd love to have you on. Yeah, I can yap about this kind of stuff for sure. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's awesome, man. Well, well, we appreciate you hopping on. And uh, for the listeners that made it to the end, we'll catch y'all next time. This has been Wildlife Outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.